Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us today in another of our series of Just Conversations. I am Kelly Brown Douglas, Dean of the Episcopal Divinity School at Union Theological Seminary in New York City. I am honored and it is a privilege to have joining me today, Alicia Garza. She is principal and founder at the Black Futures Lab. She is, as many of you know, one of the co-founders and creators of Black Lives Matter and the Black Lives Matter Global Network and, uh, and is the author of a must read book, The Purpose of Power, How We Can Come Together When We Fall Apart. And I will say throughout this conversation that that is an absolutely must read book for anybody who is really interested in transformation and a movement toward social justice in this country. Alicia, thank you for joining me on this day in this just conversation. Oh, it's so good to be here with you, Kelly. Thank you for having me. I want to jump right in because we have a short amount of time and there are many issues that I want to get to, particularly as you raise them in your book and, and helping us to understand even more the significant work that is going on at Black Futures Lab. You talk about moving really from protests to politics, from protests to a movement. Mm -hmm. And that begins, you say, with the messy work of organizing. That's right. So I wanna talk about that a little bit. You first say that one of the important things about organizing is indeed building relationships because you say a part of organizing is having a shared concern uh, or common vision or both and that you need to build relationships in order to sort of move from protest to to movement i was struck how you talked about the need if you will to build these relationships across differences with in some respects uh coalitions that may not be as progressive uh as as your own uh coalition or your own vision your own thinking can you speak uh about that in terms of what's the common foundation that's necessary to build these coalitions and to work across differences absolutely you know this is one of the most fundamental questions facing us today. And uh, let me zoom out for a second, because I think for a lot of people, when we talk about organizing, people have a lot of different definitions. For me, organizing is what happens when we come together around a common vision and a common set of concerns. We deeply understand and learn together the root causes of the problems that we face. And then we design a plan to address those challenges together. And we implement that plan and we learn from the implementation. And in the implementation of that plan, we also have to think about who else shares our concerns. And I think for a lot of people who come into movement and myself included, uh, not only does movement begin where we enter, right? <laughs> but also right. at the same time, um, I, I think that we find solace in being with people naturally that share our same concerns, that share our experiences, that share the experience of being left out and left behind. And what I was trying to get to in this piece of the book is an understanding that that's not enough. It's actually not enough to enter into organizing or movement from a place of I want to dismantle and deconstruct right. that actually the way to get to the world that we're trying to build is to reimagine how we build that world and then to practice how we live in the world that we want. And that is also a function and a byproduct of organizing. So when I talk about coalitions and alliances of the willing coalitions and alliances of people who 
we wouldn't imagine would have common cause, it's really for two purposes. I mean, one, it's for the purpose of winning, right? Obviously, we do want to make actual changes in our everyday lives, but it's also for the purpose of learning how to govern. And governance, right, is the process of bringing people together from many different walks of life, many different experiences, many different interests, and deciding, right, who belongs and who gets to come with us. And I want to challenge us as a movement, I want to challenge us as a nation to really focus on where we have lacked in relationship to that question. It's fine and easy to be in relationship with people that we like, that we agree with, that we share language with, that we share experiences with. But our country is much bigger than that. Our world is much bigger than that. And in these kinds of coalitions, what we're testing, in these alliances, what we're testing is, can we get to a higher and higher level of unity? And what is the work that it's gonna take for us to get there? Now, I'm not talking about bipartisanship. That's something that I think is irrelevant to this conversation. And the reason I think it's irrelevant is because it is largely focused on political parties that frankly are more similar than they are different if we're all telling the truth. But that's also political parties are not the only places where people come together and have to make decisions, not just for themselves, but on behalf of the people that they love and they're connected to. So in order to build that new world, we've got to build the kinds of relationships that can last and move through together all of the difficulties so that we can get to the other side together. Now, I don't have any illusions that everybody's going to make it. I think there are big challenges facing us. And frankly, there are some people who, um, and some forces, right, who are deeply invested in the way things are right now. But we owe it to ourselves to try. Um, and so those are the kinds of things that I was trying to get to there in that section. Well, you so powerfully uh, said and, and, and well said. And one of the things, even as you speak about, speak now, and certainly, comes through in your book is that we don't get there simply through tweeting uh, uh, and through social media. And, and I like the way you, you talk about that this, if we really want real change, it goes beyond trying to be the celebrity activist, uh, if you will. And while protests and those things, and you're very clear, have a place, that the real work is taking place behind the scenes. And what I'm struck by and what many people don't recognize is that you and uh, uh, Opal Tomet and uh, Patrice Cullors, it, it wasn't your first rodeo, <laughs> Black Lives Matter, right? You were doing the work already. You were already there. Like you bring up Rosa Parks, that wasn't her first rodeo. Mm -hmm. uh, and so the messy work that if you're really serious, that has to happen, that is not the work that people may see, but the work that makes a difference. And so, you know, what you describe and what you're even engaged in now on some of the most successful movements is sort of this one door knock at a time. And that, that what you're also doing is empowering people so that they can claim their power. Can you talk about how that one door knock at a time and moving from empowerment to power, moving from what everyone sees to the work that really is gonna move the needle just a little bit? Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, let me start with some shared definitions of power and empowerment. Because I think, again, these are words that get interchanged uh, and they're, they're, they are related, but they are not the same. Yeah. Empowerment is what happens when we feel good about ourselves. You know, every morning when I get up, I do my power poses. You know, I've got my sticky notes on my mirror where I remind myself that I'm worth it and all these things. And I feel good about myself and feeling good about myself allows me to enter into the world in various ways. But when I walk outside my door to go engage with the rest of the world, um, I'm, I'm struck by how empowerment is not enough. I can feel really good about myself, but if I don't have the things that I need to live well, that feeling of feeling good about yourself quickly dissipates. 
And for me, power is about much more than feeling good about ourselves. It is fundamentally about making the rules and shaping the rules. And my good friend, Holly Mitchell, who is now a, a, a member of the LA County Board of Supervisors, uh, an all woman Board of Supervisors, if I do say so myself, uh, she said to me once on my podcast, she said, well, power is about who gets what, when, and why. And I really wish I had had that definition when I wrote the book because it's so simple yet profound. Power is the ability to make the rules and shape the rules, to decide where resources go and where they don't uh, and why. Power is about our ability to shape the story of who we are and who we can be together, who belongs and who does not, what our values are. And power is about, frankly, being able to move an agenda and for there to be consequences when the people that you elect to move your agenda don't do that. That is about feeling good about yourself, but it's fundamentally about rules. And it's also about culture. And we need everybody to have a say in what happens in their daily lives. But beyond that, we need everybody to feel responsible for having a say over what happens to us and what happens in our community. You know, door knocking for me is how I learned organizing, and I'm so grateful for that. I, I entered into this work um, from a service perspective and from an advocacy perspective. For many, many years, I did work uh, that was speaking on behalf of, right, or um, trying to take the best interests of a group to a decision maker. But what you lose there is people's own sense of the fact that they can be the superheroes in their own stories. And the process of organizing is really about helping to illuminate for each person um, who is the superhero in you. Every single day we're taught that the things that are shaping our lives are out of our hands or that somebody else is responsible for it. And at best, right, we talk about, you know, using the legal system or we talk about, you know, getting a lawyer, getting somebody else to take care of it. And at the worst, what we do is um, we classify who deserves to be in a position to make decisions over their own lives and who doesn't. What organizing does is it helps us build the kinds of relationships that can activate change. And not just um, from coming together, which is what happens in protest. I mean, protest in a campaign can be a tactic that puts pressure on a target, a decision maker, somebody who has the power to give you what you want, as we say. But protest is also what happens when people enter, right? It's, I'm upset about something, I want something to change, I wanna stop something from happening. It has a very specific and unique role. But I think sometimes what happens is we say, protest is the way that we get everything, and it's actually not. Mm -hmm. Protest is the way that we most immediately express or that we most immediately intervene in bad things that are happening. But intervening in bad things that are happening is not the totality of our work. Um, tweeting about things that are happening is not the totality of our work. The totality of our work is to put together, again, a fragmented society that is both um, deeply unaware of our own power and also deeply distanced from it. And so when I sit at kitchen tables, when I bounce grandbabies on my knees, like what I am doing there is I'm trying to get a sense from each person of what their freedom dreams are. And I'm trying to remind them that their freedom dreams are my freedom dreams and they're the freedom dreams of other people in their communities. And if we would just put our gates down and unlock those bars and open the gates on our doors, we might remember that we depend on each other to survive and that that dependence, it could be parasitic, right? It could be corrosive or it could be a different way and we've actually seen it. And so what we're doing in this process is we're reminding each other that um, nobody's coming to save us, right? That ultimately, if we are that interdependent, then we also can depend on each other for the new world that we long for. Um, and I and I I, I want to say that I I don't mean to in the book and you know we've gotten some critiques about this and people say you know, I think social media has a much bigger influence and role. Sure, I'm somebody who grew up um, with an analog childhood and I now have a digital adulthood. So I certainly understand the power and the impact of 
what social media can do across geography and across boundaries that were hard to cross before. But I don't want us to mistake that social media um, somehow replaces the relationships that we need to make change. Social media is a landscape of avatars. And in a lot of ways, it does reflect our communities in the sense that we put forward, right, what we want people to see. The difference between social media and how our communities interact is that um, in our communities, you can't hide from all the other things and you can't hide all the other things. On social media, you get to craft who you want to be and how you want people to see you. But in our neighborhoods, you can't hide who has water and who doesn't. You can't hide who lives on the streets and who doesn't. And, and it forces us to deal with it. Um, and so that's what I'm asking us to do is to activate our superpowers so that we can grapple with some of the biggest and most enduring challenges of our time. But Alicia, yes. And what you're also saying, I mean, this thing that Brian Stevenson may call proximity, that in, we're at a theological institution, we talk about liberation theology and the power of the people, but we don't get to know the people that we're talking about the power of the people, right? We might not even like the people. Uh, <laughs> but we certainly don't take the time oftentimes to listen to, and I want to get back to this freedom dream thing, listen to the dreams of the people. And we go into the communities and we say, oh yeah, 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 you need this or you need that. And that may not be what the people need. And so I'm just struck that you were not only unleashing the power of the people and for as you empower them, unleashing them and helping them to see their own power, but you're gaining power in learning and 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 that you know that we oftentimes, even with our best intent, we're just top down, sort of the charity barrel kind of phenomenon, instead of uh, from bottom up. And so as you talk about that so powerfully, sort of one door knock at a time, and people come to even trust you and 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 these coalitions are built that you can change what's happening in a community. And that's the beginning, right? Of changing what's happening in the world. The other thing is you talk about people learning how to exercise their power. I was so struck as we are struck today in our society of the way in which you spoke of rightly so, the way the religious right mm -hmm. has been able to organize, coalesce their power, uh, control elections until this one. Uh, <laughs> I will get to that one. Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> control elections. And yet people ask all the time, so where are the progressives? Where's the progressive faith community? What are the ways in which you've been disappointed in the quote unquote progressive uh, community and what can uh, the progressive uh, faith community, what are the lessons that we can learn from you and even the religious right and, and the work that you're doing? And I'm going to get to Black Futures Lab, but what, where is the progressives and what can we do? Well, look, <clears throat> uh, there's a couple ways I would approach this question. And I love you're it. hard because you're hard in your book. <laughs> yeah, I mean, listen. I, <sighs> The major critique that I have of the progressive movement is that it has never been robust and rigorous in addressing the concerns and the needs of Black communities. Yeah. I always say that the progressive movement also often reminds me of like college catalogs, right? Where you, you know, the way that we project ourselves, it's like you have one person with disabilities, you have one person wearing a hijab, you have one person who's black, you know, and it's, but that's representation. That is not um, substance around not only what we're dealing with right now, but what it is that we want to see done about it. And you know, if there's something that we can learn from our opposition, and I certainly see the Christian right as our opposition in this moment, and has been our opposition for quite a long time. I mean, the things that we're experiencing right now have been fueled in part by the mobilization and the 
evangelizing of the Christian right, um, this set of values and policies that are deeply destructive to our world. Mm -hmm. And that's not to say that all Christians are this or that. It's to say that there is an organized movement, right, that has been shaping the landscape of politics and they intersect at politics and faith. Right. Um, and I, I think, you know, one of the things that we can learn and one of the things that we can um, build off of in terms of our, our communities of faith is that forever, forever, uh, our, our, our faith communities have been the bedrock upon which we fight. Um, you know, when you look at movements throughout history, the thing that connects us, right, is that um, with all things that we have not achieved yet, there has to be a foundation upon which we stand that allows us to believe in and know that a thing is there that we cannot touch, taste, smell, hear, right? Mm -hmm. But yes. some a belief that there is something bigger than us. Greater than us, that's right. That we are called, right, to um, continue to advance and to continue to develop in, in ourselves and in others. Um, it is the most selfless and at the same time selfish practice of human beings, right? To want to understand our purpose in the world, to want to understand our lot in the world, and to also know that we cannot possibly understand everything. And so there is a place in which we have to surrender to that which organizes us outside of our control. Our opposition does this in a number of ways that we can learn from. And I don't believe in like replicating the strategies of the opposition. I'm like, well, if we're gonna do that, we might as well just do what they do <laughs> and be who they are. Um, but there are some things that we can take into consideration. One, the way in which they are home for so many people, the way in which they help so many people make sense of the world and why it is the way that it is, the way in which they identify who is responsible for the way that you are experiencing the world and the way in which there are many entry points into their movement. You don't have to be um, a protester to be a part of their movement. You don't have to be a policy advocate to be a part of their movement. Like they are literally like, come one, come all, we will find a place for you. We don't do that very well. We split hairs around the smallest atoms of things. And it makes us feel better because we just want to be clear, right? <laughs> but at the same time, um, there are millions of people who are looking for us and they cannot find us because we construct artificial barriers to their entry. And for Black folks in particular, I think, um, I rarely hear Black people say I'm a progressive. Yeah, Black that's... people, we believe in justice, we believe in fairness, we believe in accountability, and fundamentally, we believe in each other, <laughs> right? But we, from our experience, um, have learned not to trust movements, because so many of us have been left out and left behind. This moment that we're in right now is a moment that we must take advantage of where the issues and the needs and the concerns of our community are front and center. Now, just because everybody's talking about it doesn't mean things are gonna be done about it. That is our task. But the first thing we have to make sure we do is not invite black people in as window dressing. Um, we need to invite black people in to lead it to lead it. And that is true in every sector and the faith community is no exception to that rule. No, that's right. And that's, and time is getting away. So, so much on city, but that's right. And you talk about that so powerfully as you lift up the difference between diversity, representation and intersectionality, borrowing from Kimberly Crenshaw and intersection is which you said and, and more, but you know, invite people in to lead it, to set to set the agenda, because you say so strongly the end that black people uh, who can lead, will lead, and will lead us to a better place. And we know, as even the 1619 project showed us, that anytime we've moved closer 
to the democracy that we aspire to and have never been. It's been black people uh, that have led the way to that. This leads me, I wanna ask you about uh, Black Futures Lab and one last question. And, and so let me sort of bring two together uh, because Black Futures Lab puts into place, you know, moves from protest to, to politics and takes seriously and politics, which oftentimes the black community shuns and voting, but you talk about voting is a movement. And, and we see how important it is because of the way in which the black vote is now being attacked and, and, and the tactics of suppression. So uh, can you bring together like sort of the work that you're doing in, and I invite everyone to go to the webpage of Black Futures Lab, the work that you are doing in Black Futures Lab and, and the significance of being engaged politically and being engaged with policy. And one thing I'll say about your Black Futures Lab, why it's called Futures Lab, you literally, you did something that's like, hello, you ask Black people. <laughs> hello. <laughs> hello. <laughs> so. Yes, I love talking about this. And I, I, look, Kelly, I'll just say, for me, I have spent my whole career reimagining what a world would look like where we were powerful inside of it. And the Black Futures Lab, our focus is making Black communities powerful in politics so that we can be powerful in the rest of our lives. Mm. And what I love about this project is that we're not just replicating the things that have always been done in Black communities with varying results. We bring people into our team that know deeply how things work, but who long for a better way and a different way that is tailored to our people. And so it's been the joy of my life to build these two scrappy organizations <laughs> from an idea that came to me, you know, during the 2016 elections when we were being treated as a political football and getting nothing out of it. Um, and now leading that organization into this moment. And you're right, we started this project with a listening project called the Black Census, which is now widely known as the largest survey of Black people in America in 156 years. And in that project, we talked to Black people in all 50 states from every demographic that you could think of about what it is that we experience every day and what it is that we wanna see for our futures. We heard over and over again that nobody ever asks me what I think what I dream about, how I would fix things. And that is not good for democracy. So what we did was we turned that data into a legislative agenda called the Black Agenda for 2020. And it is a roadmap for how it is that we make Black Lives Matter from City Hall to Congress. And it's driven by the dreams and the needs of Black people across this nation. We've also developed and designed what we call a Build Back Boulder Plan, a Black mandate for the Biden-Harris administration, understanding that there is more possible in this next four years than has been possible in the last decade, largely because of the work and the sacrifice of so many across the world, right? We have created political and cultural space for change. And so now we are driving home that mandate which Black voters brought to the polls in November and again in January in Georgia. We have changed the balance of power in Congress. We've changed the who's in power in the White House. And now it's time for us to reap what we have sown. Um, and for us, that looks like a bunch of different things. It means um, making sure that our communities deeply understand what is happening and what's at stake and how they can be involved. It means activating and motivating our communities year round, not just when we want something from them during election cycles. It means checking in on our people like we did uh, when the pandemic first hit. There was a lot of organizations, you know, asking for money and doing a bunch of things and we didn't do any of that. We just sent an email to our supporter list and said, tell us how you're doing. And we heard all these stories from people about their fears, their anxieties, but also the ways in which they were coming together that surprised them. We heard heroic stories from all over the nation about Black folks who were stepping up to take care of each other. And we want to leverage that, 
right? So um, we also invest in our communities. We invest in Black-led, Black-focused organizations across the country to help them do their work better. Um, we also train our people how to make new rules and eliminate the rules that have been rigged against us for so long. And in fact, in the midst of this pandemic, we launched the Black to the Future Public Policy Institute. We had over 550 applications from across the country. We graduated 39 Black fellows from a 20-week fellowship where they designed policy campaigns that they are running in their communities. And this year we're investing in those campaigns, making sure we get them over the finish line, changing sentencing guidelines, increasing digital access for black trans communities, uh, 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 creating health indexes, right? For black communities, uh, making sure that uh, we are kind of creating new community and that black folks are leading that. So, I, I mean, for me, the Black Futures Lab, um, it is my happy place. It is the place where we lean into not just the dismantling, right, but the building. And we build that muscle of what it would take to actually run our own stuff. <laughs> and so that's what we're up to. And if people who are watching want to check us out, you can check us out at blackfutureslab.org. Uh, people who are watching, check them out. You need to check them out and spread the word. Uh, Alicia, when I, in the book and when I read, uh, even have been on Black Futures, but even, but in the book, reading about Black Futures Lab brought tears to my eyes. Thank you. Because it's talking about Black Futures and you actually ask Black people, what kind of future do you want for yourself? And Black Futures Lab, and that's why I want to just give you time to talk about it, because Black Futures Lab tries to help Black people to have the future they want for themselves. And what you make so clear is if in this country, Black people have the future they want with, for themselves, everybody that's will right. benefit. That's right. I gotta, I, I, I would be remiss to not at least as uh, ask this question, you have an epilogue, and then I'm then I'm gonna I've taken you over, so I'm gonna let you go. Yeah, all good. But your epilogue in your book talks about trauma, mm -hmm. and you use a personal pain of trauma to talk about trauma as a community and the way the a black experience, as are other experiences of of marginalized people, particularly people of color in this country are experiences that are just characterized by trauma and pain. But, uh, and how we so often are just re-traumatized this week, you know, this last couple of weeks with the Chauvin trial, uh, with Dante, right, with Adam Toledo. And you, know, you can't turn on the news. You don't want to, you're re-traumatized. And here in the union community, we had a symbol of hate, uh, uh, white terrorist hate uh, that was left in our community. And you could see the way in which particularly people of color in this community were re-traumatized. Mm -hmm. You talk about in your book, how so often that we turn that even in on ourselves and do harm to even those who would be our in solidarity with us and we act out of places of trauma. And you talk about how we can not do that. Can you, we need to hear that now in this community and in this country, given what's going on right now in our country with trauma that just never stops. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> you know, for me, one of the greatest traumas in my life has been losing my mother. Um, it will be three years uh, at the end of this month, next week, actually. And that experience reorganized me. And it made me think a lot about the ways in which grief and trauma reorganizes our communities. And without the tools to be able to be powerful in that reorganization, we are set to turn against each other um, the weapons of fear and sadness and rage. 
that um, actually need to be transformed into a profound love for one another and a profound care. And one of the pieces of infrastructure that our communities lack are those tools. Um, because rules have been rigged against us for so long, we have become accustomed to a level of trauma that is unbearable for anyone and should be unbearable for anyone. And I put this piece in the book because I really wanted us to consider that so much of the way that we talk about care is whimsy and flimsy, and flimsy right? Mm -hmm. It's whimsical and it's flimsy. It is um, bubble baths and buying stuff for yourself. And, you know, often it tells us to disappear from the things that are hard. But the reality is change is hard. And every single day we are faced with things that um, we are grateful that we have survived. But surviving is not enough. We are actually moving in a direction where we say that everybody deserves to thrive. And in order for us to thrive, we have to change an economy, right? That traumatizes us. We have to change a democracy that leaves us out and leaves us behind. We have to change a society that tells us that we are less than human and then um, supports rules, right? That make us less than human. And if we don't take this work as seriously as we do the other pieces of our work, we will not succeed. You know, I've seen a lot over this last decade and I've been in this work for a long time. And one of the things that I've learned is that if we don't pay attention to this, um, we haven't completed and we won't complete the process of transformation that we're being called to. Um, we can't build something new if every time we get a little bit farther, we just decide to claw each other apart because that is what is within reach. And it's, I'm not trying to scold anybody. I have engaged in these practices and I have been the recipient of these practices. And all the time it makes, it reminds me of all the things that I've dealt with as a more public person where people literally, they go for your jugular and they want like, you know, your eyeball as an offering right? <laughs> for any kind of mistake that you ever make. Then they're um, done. <laughs> yeah, I want us to reconsider. Um, conflict is not the problem. The problem is that we lack tools to get to the other side of conflict intact together with a commitment to holding and advancing each other by any means necessary. And I, I, I long for us to have those tools and I long for us to consider that as we are building our strategies, building our campaigns. And I think for the faith community in particular, this is a calling. Um, what, where are the places where we can intervene in the designed attacks that we wage on each other. And by designed, I don't just mean designed by our opposition and you know the state, we, those are predictable and we know about those things. But there is a piece of it that um, we are scared to win and we can be scared of what stands in our way of winning. And sometimes what stands in our way of winning is us. So. Mm -hmm as we enter into this next period, which will undoubtedly be full of grief and full of rage, we are called to remind ourselves each time, what does our care look like in this moment? I don't know about you, Kelly, but I want us to be the last one standing. <laughs> right? And in order for that to happen, um, we need to build the mechanisms for that to be real. I'm going to end it there. Such wisdom, such power, such commitment, and you end your book on hope as well, such hope. And I cannot say enough. The book is a must read. Uh, tell me that I don't, I don't want to mess up the name of uh, your book. Uh, the Purpose of Power how we come together when we fall apart, a must read and visit Black Futures Lab and get involved. Thank you, Alicia Garza.
Thank you so much. Love you. Love you. Hold on.